Welcome back, ladies, gentlemen, and all else to another video. I appreciate your patience with me regarding uploading since it has slowed down quite a bit recently. Mental health is really important to take care of, so I am making sure to do so. I have projects and work outside of YouTube which also take time, so there's that, but I am trying to prioritize my well-being by not spending too much time stressing over video making and making sure to relax, so I thank you for understanding that. Productivity does not define your worth, always remember that. So today, I'm back with another creepypasta review for you all, this time about the world of Super Mario. Yes, today we are taking a look at the story Super Mario 128, a clear reference to the 128 Mario tech demonstration from the Nintendo Space World trade show of 2000, which showcased the power of the GameCube and the mysterious sequel to Super Mario 64, sometimes nicknamed Super Mario 64 2 or Super Mario 128 that was later cancelled due to the failure of the 64 disk drive. I know of another game that was cancelled due to the failure of the 64 disk drive. Yeah, Super Mario 128 has been a mystery for like years now. This story right here is still on the Creepypasta wiki and actually credited to the same author who wrote Dead Bart back in the day, K.I. Simpson. It's quite an old story actually, having been added to the Creepypasta wiki back in 2012, and it's presumably a classic of the genre, though I have personally never read it until the making of this video. I believe I began reading and learning of Creepypastas around the time of 2011 or so, so I believe this story released just as the genre was really starting to take hold and gaining traction, at least from my recollection, though I might be wrong on that. Once or twice I have seen mentions of this story online, but I never read it for myself, and I have heard mixed things about it. So for this video, I decided to finally experience it for myself. Let's see how it holds up nowadays and what my thoughts on it are. This is Super Mario 128, written by K.I. Simpson. The story begins by describing the almost absence of real Mario platformers from 1997 to 2005, the only one being released during that time being Super Mario Sunshine. In the fictional narrative of the story, after not receiving as much success with the N64 and GameCube compared to earlier consoles such as the NES and SNES, and glancing at the success of more realistic and mature titles on Sony's PlayStation, Nintendo seemed keen on revitalizing the Mario franchise in that same serious vein on the GameCube. I guess this is how we got those hardcore Mario football games. Miyamoto thought that Mario and Luigi should act more like grown-ups for the upcoming GameCube games. This more serious direction then supposedly saw its first game release with Luigi's Mansion, a darker Mario game than what had been seen before, though still toned down considerably compared to what some Nintendo executives wanted. Some had tossed around the idea of a project going even further than what Luigi's Mansion did. The other game released during that time, Super Mario Sunshine, went in the completely opposite direction, reaffirming the bright, cheerful feeling of Mario that fans of the time knew and loved. This to me seems a little bit confusing. If Nintendo were looking to make Mario a darker franchise, why would they release one game that, while retaining the goofy charm of the franchise, was a little bit spookier than before in Luigi's Mansion, while then creating an entirely other game that kept up the fun brightness of the franchise in Sunshine? Perhaps in the narrative of the story, Nintendo wanted to see what would gain more success and attention to gauge where to go next. Maybe that is what the author is getting at and perhaps I'm just nitpicking. This attempt at diversifying the franchise would prove unsuccessful, as the GameCube failed to reach the success of the PlayStation 2, as the market seemingly demanded more violent, realistic games instead. It seemed the happy-go-lucky days of the plumber were coming to an end, as Nintendo grew more and more pressured to take the franchise in new, daring directions. The darker project previously tossed around before by executives, nicknamed Super Mario 128, was picked up again, and to this day, no one knows quite what went down at Nintendo during that time, according to the story. However, a prototype of Super Mario 128 was leaked online by an anonymous source inside Nintendo, which could be played on a Wii homebrew channel, and the author then delves into their experiences with this prototype. It's the first time I'm hearing of it though, but let's cut the story some slack. It's obviously going for a narrative to set the stage that isn't necessarily based in exact real-world history. It is at least inspired by it, but taking some liberties. This is neither good nor bad, and while for some it might detract from the experience knowing that a simple Google search can disprove the story, for others it might be able to be disregarded with suspension of disbelief so that the narrative of the story can get going. Let's see where the story takes this concept. The game began with nothing but a plain main menu showing the title Super Mario 128. And after starting the game, Bowser's laugh was heard alongside a text box with the dialogue Mario. 
I have taken Princess Peach, and she will not live to see the sun rise tomorrow, unless you take her place. You know what to do, and where to go. Do not try to stop me, unless you want to hasten her death. Alongside this peculiar message, Mario's character model appeared realistically proportioned and with the same quality as his Super Mario Galaxy model, though his head remained looking like his N64 model, clearly an unfinished aspect of the game. Mario found himself in a sky level with graphically impressive clouds in the background, but no music or enemies present, as they were seemingly not added yet. And all in all, the level proved not very difficult, jumping from platform to platform. Throughout the level, the graphics began altering as the sky turned cloudier and rain started falling. Toad soon appeared on a platform, looking as detailed as Mario, with dialogue stating, We don't want you anymore, Mario. You don't belong here. Just give Bowser what he wants. Die. After this foreboding message played, the player lost control of Mario as the plumber stood still for a few moments before turning around and walking off the platform. After falling down for quite some time, a realistic modern city appeared under him, and with a realistic sounding thud, Mario hit the ground and lay there for a couple of minutes as people passed him, coldly and angrily ignoring him until they stopped showing up leaving Mario alone. Mario could now be controlled again, moving slower and without the ability to jump. The plumber entered a small house in the city titled House of Torn Memories, where furniture and the like seemed scaled so that it appeared as if Mario was a small child. These objects were covered in dust, broken or rotting, and the house appeared empty. After entering a door leading to the basement, the author was shocked to discover a broken TV alongside a rickety old couch with two skeletons, seemingly small enough to be the skeletons of children, sitting there. A loud, ear-piercing crash was soon heard from the game as what seemed to be Bowser crashed through the floor below and landed in front of Mario, though the author was confused by the King Koopa's appearance. He appeared more sinister than ever before, with longer arms and legs and sharp, dangerous claws, an organic-looking green shell and threatening black eyes and giant teeth. Mario, in complete terror, shivered as the creature then said, You've kept me waiting long enough, Mario. I will taste flesh soon. Will you finally surrender, or does Peach have to die? Without being able to control Mario, the former hero stood there, before nodding to the frightening interpretation of Bowser. Bowser impaled Mario with his long claws, brought Mario up close to his face, before biting the head off the plumber off, as Mario's character model was ruined. The screen faded to black as another level began, titled Mario's Eternal Home, where Mario's character model returned to its normal undamaged state. Nothing else was present in the level except for this model, as the background was nothing but darkness, as if Mario was floating in space, drifting in the direction the player controlled him towards. As the author did this, soon voices began fading in, echoing sentiments of how Mario was worthless, unwanted, and unimportant. High-pitched crying which sounded like Mario's soon pierced through the voices, and this made the author hold back tears. Somehow, the game was affecting the author on a deeply emotional level. Several minutes of this occurred, until a grey speck of light appeared in the distance. Moving towards it took a very long time, and once the light was in view, it was revealed to be a tombstone, cracked and rather plain. What was written on the tombstone caused the author to turn off their system immediately after reading it, vowing to never play the beta or hack or whatever the prototype was ever again. For on the tombstone, there was only one word written. Innocence. And that is the admittedly very sudden ending of Super Mario 128. I do find it quite disappointing that that is how the story ends. It feels quite unsatisfying and honestly rather unbelievable as I don't quite buy that a tombstone saying innocence would be the final straw to make the author quit the experience. Though perhaps the unexplainable emotional reaction the author had to the final moments of the story caused them to immediately react, though again that feels slightly difficult to believe. Symbolically though, I think the word innocence makes quite a bit of sense if one views the story as a whole, at least from my personal perspective. The story begins by detailing how Nintendo felt pressured and pushed into a corner as more violent, realistic, and less cartoony video games were the ones finding success in the early 2000s, at least according to the story. 
the world seemed to demand more violence, more horror, more realism, and the old ways of carefree video gaming seemed to be on the way out. The innocence of the industry and the world as a whole seemed to disappear more and more each day as the world evolved. Obviously nowadays we know that both violent, mature games and kid-friendly cartoon-like games can exist at the same time and both find success, but from the perspective of Nintendo during the time of this fictional story, they appeared ready to transition into this more somber view of the world but not without lamenting simple, easy days long gone. The world seemed to not want simple, childish Mario games anymore, represented by the people coldly walking past the fallen Mario, despite the poor hero being clearly hurt. Thus, the old Mario is eternally stuck in an endless dark void where he feels constantly unwanted, as the rest of the world moves on. Toad wants nothing to do with the plumber. Mario's character model seems at odds with itself, stuck between its old version and new, and Bowser has changed into a much more frightening, naturalistic version of the character, possibly to keep up with the change in the market, finding it easy to adapt to this new world. I might be looking too deep into this story, but I wonder if Bowser biting off Mario's N64 heads is meant to represent the destruction of older Mario games. Just a thought. The imagery of the small skeletons in front of the broken television could signify this change even further. Innocent children's entertainment is dead. There is no place for it anywhere anymore. And this reality comes literally crashing through the floor in the form of the terrifying new Bowser, reminding Mario of the fact that eventually, Mario has to surrender. Conceptually, I think the story is actually pretty interesting, even if it isn't very plausible. It takes a cool idea of Nintendo being pushed into a corner and desperately attempting to survive in an ever-changing landscape and expands on it by showing just how the company may have dealt with the situation and felt about it. For some, this idea might be a bit difficult to go along with and may end up too distracting for one to enjoy and that is completely understandable. I wouldn't blame anyone for that. From my perspective though, I was able to entertain this story in my mind a fair bit despite knowing that it wasn't true. I found it entertaining and intriguing and wanted to know where it would go next. I am nonetheless disappointed in the sudden ending and by today's standards, sure, there are some usual creepypasta tropes at play here such as there being no enemies, the game acting darker than usual, or the author reacting strongly to the game, but at the time when this was written, these things were not nearly as established as they are now years later. I would definitely have preferred a better ending to the story that could have wrapped things up in a more satisfying way. As it stands, the story just ends on that one word, innocence. I hypothesized the author was going for one of those typical one-liners that horror stories often end with, such as, the call was coming from inside the house, or, who was phone? Similarly to how Dead Bart ended with that, all of their deaths are listed as the same date line, leaving the reader with several questions and hopefully an uneasy feeling by the end. I think the story spent quite a bit of time world building and setting up the story so I think it is a shame that it ends so abruptly after that. It is a longer story than Dead Bart, basically double the length, and in my opinion it is a superior story, as I feel the author built upon their idea of a more mature direction for the Mario franchise quite well and capitalized on it being a video game centered creepypasta. I believe that this was one of the first of its kind, though don't quote me on that. Either way, I actually walked away from the story with an overall positive impression. No, it's not realistic at all, and it is not perfect, but for a video game creepypasta, I think it is actually a slight cut above the rest. It does stand out in my mind more than a lot of other lost video game stories. I enjoyed it for what it was and the imagined scenario it presented. I think the author did a pretty good job with the material, and that's that. I'm unsure if this is an unpopular opinion or not. I don't quite know how general audiences view this story, but hey, that's my opinion. I enjoyed Super Mario 128 for what it was, and found it to be an interesting take on the change in the market from old ways to the new and all of the trials and tribulations it came along with. Despite a letdown of an ending, I enjoy the intriguing world building and exploring the prototype to discover its secrets. Those are my thoughts and that's that. It's not my favorite story in the world, but I found it to be alright. If you disagree, that's totally fine. I appreciate you for hearing me out. Remember that if you have constructive criticism, make sure to be kind, understanding, and encouraging about it to make sure any author tries again with their writing. Sure, sometimes it is alright to be harsh, but I think encouragement is also very important. That's what I think it should all be about, wanting authors to work on their writings to create better things moving forward. I think that should be that for this video. I certainly hope you enjoyed it. I really like diving into these individual stories and reviewing them, it's actually quite a bit of fun. If you did find this video entertaining, make sure you leave a like and comment your thoughts down below. Follow me on my social medias if you'd like, or check out my Patreon page if you want to support the channel directly.
Thank you very much for watching and for being patient with me. I really do appreciate it. Stay awesome, everyone. Good bye.